Why don't you tell me a little bit about your particular career path? My first job as a director was when I was fairly young. I got a break to direct a 7-Up commercial featuring Fido Dido or Fido Dido character. Uh, that's now being relaunched, which is super fun. Called Baboon way back then. From then, I uh, sold some ideas to MTV Animation. That went well enough that when delivering a couple of MTV IDs, the station IDs, you know, with the M and the little T and the V, doing fun animated things. And uh, we were called in by Abby Trucooley, and he had this film to show us, and it was on three quarter inch tape, and he had the big machine in his office, and ka chung, it went down there into the machine, and the lights were off, and it was just me and my partner Brian Mulroney. And it was, on the screen came two ovals with these super ugly kids in it. And they were just like looking at each other and just laughing stupidly. And they kept laughing and they kept laughing and I started laughing and he started laughing and we were all laughing and he stopped the tape. And he said, so, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, off we went. They had done uh, some number of episodes with another studio in New York, and, and they were doing a great job, but um, at some point it seemed that uh, MTV was going to be doing it, doing it in-house with their own animation studio that they were about to create for doing this. So we were the first two hires as director at MTV Animation. What grew in a studio of 100 people and, and some really iconic stuff, Beavis and Butthead, of course, grew into an iconic brand. It spun off Daria, which was another iconic brand, which they're going to bring back now. Uh, from there, I was drafted by MTV Films to write some sketch comedy to, for a feature film they were trying to do. So I put together a team. That was my first full-length screenplay. From that, I sold a couple of other screenplay ideas, but more pivotally, I was uh, drafted by DreamWorks. At first, I, I story consulted on Shrek 2 and on Madagascar, and based on my input on those, they offered me a full-time contract. So then I became a, a contracted director, soon uh, evolved into being a director-writer. So I became more of an idea person and gradually shifted my entire focus to writing and development away from direction. And now I rarely direct anything anymore except voices. So now we're a writing and development company. We take ideas, we, we make their story engine work, and we have experience working globally to fit different global markets. It's a great model, and it seems to be a win-win for people. And we're, we've, we've collected a pool of talent that has collectively 27 Emmys, and uh, even though it's a small but mighty team, we're just some of the best and the best in the business. And I'm, I'm very honored that such good writers want to work with us. What role does animation play in Africa today? Africa is a population center. It's an extremely fast-growing population center, particularly Northwest Africa. It's going to be a pivotal part of broadcast business in the in the future and it's only going to continue in that direction for for any foreseeable future to be invited to take the skills that we've learned as baboon developing shows for all over the world uh, so far we our only collaboration had been with South Africa but the rest of Africa was fascinating to me when you create uh, markets in new territories you want them to be in the voice of those places it would be silly to just you know try to feed one culture's entertainment food to another culture it's going to work a little bit it's not going to work a lot much better if you can organically create stuff that speaks from the culture it lives in and speaks to the culture it lives in. and that's what excited me about it it was the last frontier in terms of a creative mission to find how to make cultural things work that then can go from beyond Africa to the rest of the globe. Because we know the rest of the globe audience, that's, that's our sandbox. And uh, the African stuff I've, I've found to be incredibly accessible. Incredibly accessible. I mean, it's so much of the stuff just, it would speak to kids in Brooklyn. And, you know, I have no doubt that this stuff is potentially quite universal. Talent needs to be developed. There's not just enough of it yet, but you know, it's the, for, the first signs are extremely encouraging.